it's I was relatively optimistic about the state of the war uh, towards the end of 67 uh, but I should frame that uh, response by telling you the position I took in April of 67 that was when Westmoreland came back and asked for additional troops uh, something like a quarter of a million and there was a fundamental debate about the course of the war and uh, in a very rare occasion of my intervening around the cabinet table I had ample opportunities to talk to the president directly I stood up and I said in effect uh, I don't believe it should be more of the same I think we should act decisively and by decisively I don't mean heavier bombing I mean that we should go into North Vietnam as far north as Vinh and when the weather's right onto the Ho Chi Minh trails with US forces and force an ending of the war on the ground and that was the view that I held and uh, because I thought that the war otherwise would be excruciatingly prolonged for the people of Southeast Asia, the United States, and the world, and that we should use our power decisively in those two ways. Uh, I accepted the President's decision that we would not move in that direction and pursue his intermediate strategy. And at the end of 67, I was optimistic for these reasons. First, there was no doubt at all there had been military progress since we came in in mid-65. There had been extraordinary political progress and economic progress, including a turnaround in agricultural policy where they finally bit the bullet and gave the peasants enough incentives. And uh, secondly, I was optimistic because we had perfectly adequate intelligence that Hanoi agreed with us. And they, we had this intelligence that they felt the war slipping away and they were going to make a maximum effort. Uh, we began to hear, a, to get a picture of just what that effort would be about the end of November 1967. And I sent out on my own responsibility uh, asking uh, for an evaluation of the coming big offensive to, and of the possibilities of negotiating, negotiating after it, uh, assuming it was set back. And I was confident it would be set back. And uh, they sent back this, uh, a country team assessment, and we all went over it, and uh, CIA commented on it. So that by early December, we were all geared up for this maximum effort, but it was a maximum effort in response to the progress that we'd made. Uh, so I, I, as the year ended, I knew it was going to be mighty noisy, and the president did too. Uh, he told the Australians... Sorry. Can take two. This optimism that I had was uh, fully shared, of course, by Ambassador Bunker and General Westmoreland. And the Soviet diplomats like to say this was not accidental because the most fundamental source of intelligence for the president and the whole community on the war and the one the historians are going to treasure and I believe is being made available now by the LBJ library were the uh, country team reports which were extraordinarily detailed uh, the picture drawn militarily politically economically with the warts on and uh, they the, the reason that they were uh, so important, valued, valued was that they held up over time. Uh, we were never jumped by anything in Vietnam in the whole period I was there uh, because the country team reports were so accurate. Uh, the notion that uh, the president uh, had inadequate information is simply not correct. His most fundamental information was this summarized information. Of course, he got an awful lot of the component pieces of that information, economic reports, diplomatic reports, military reports regularly. But those summations were absolutely first class, solid, and there was continu continuity in them. And anyone following the whole story and reading our evaluation and what happened and looking at what Hanoi's evaluation was from intelligence uh, could not avoid uh, judgment. There'd been uh, a very solid amount of improvement since the middle of 1965. What was the president's reaction when the Tet Offensive actually happened? And what was your own reaction? Well, the president is, uh, knew that this was coming uh, from early December 1967. He had told the uh, Australian cabinet uh, when I happened to be present, when we went out there for the service for Harold Holt when he was drowned. Uh, he had told them that uh, in response to a question, uh, the question incidentally was interesting. It was, uh, do you think uh, this would be a good time for a bombing halt and an attempt at a negotiation? And his response was, not now. 
uh, this was just before Christmas 67, he said, we're going to have a very hard winter. They, they're going to make a maximum effort. We shall see kamikaze tactics. When they're set back, that will be the time uh, for a, a peace move. And then he went right on. Uh, he went on and said, I'm not sure that uh, in the course of an election year, they will finally settle it. Uh, but I think we have a chance of getting into negotiations. And so uh, he, in other words, had this thing very firmly in mind, and the cables that came from Westmoreland in the period just before the Tet Offensive uh, gave a, him a very precise sense, and all of us, a sense that the thing was heightening, it might come any day. As you know, Westmoreland asked that the, and received uh, permission, A, to cancel the U.S. leaves at Tet, and B, to resume bombing uh, despite the Tet uh, stand down in the tactical areas uh, uh, in the, uh, near the uh, truce lines. And uh, President Johnson's, uh, you remember we did have a bombing halt for Tet, and President Johnson's response to his cable, uh, Westmoreland's request, I transmitted to him the request. He said, yes, I agree, uh, he can do that. And he said, if it was up to me, I'd cancel the whole goddamn thing. Uh, he knew very well that this was the, it was about to come. He could not uh, get the uh, South Vietnamese alerted. They tried, and some of them were off for holiday. And, uh, but as far as the president was concerned, he was fully prepared. Well, how, <coughs> if uh, the offensive was anticipated, uh, how did you explain that the, the, the Viet Cong was able to get in, let's say, as far as the American Embassy in Saigon or yes. live out the way for a while? Well, the, the, uh, the tactics that were used involved their infiltration into the town in rather subtle ways, and they surfaced and they were able to not get into the U.S. Embassy, they were able to get into the, the yard. Uh, and uh, they did manage to infiltrate into uh, the, the towns of, of Vietnam, uh, quite a few VC. And they did so expecting an uprising once their presence became known. What happened was the VC were turned over to the police or the militia or whomever and were decimated. But uh, it was a tactic, a very expensive tactic, from which the communists in the South have not recovered to this day. Uh, South Vietnam, even despite the war, was in many ways still a relatively open society. People moved around all over it. And uh, getting into Saigon was no big trick. Do you think then that, that, uh, <coughs> that our armed forces didn't take enough precautions to prevent that? Well, the, our forces were not responsible for the security of the city. They had very different missions. And I'm not sure that uh, the... Uh, any normal. Start one more time. Our forces. The mic. I don't believe uh, our forces had the kind of re responsibility for the security of the towns. Those forces, the security of the towns, in the hands of the police, the militia, the Arvin, and infiltrating people into a town of that kind uh, could be done. It turned out to be a disaster for the Viet Cong. Now they got into Hue, that, but those are North Vietnamese military, and there was a pitched, prolonged battle, as you know, in Hue, and they were thrown out by the South Vietnamese Marines, not the U.S. But uh, so that I don't think it was a very remarkable achievement to get a lot of fellows in there. Uh, the, the, it would have been remarkable if they'd triggered an uprising, but they triggered uh, uh, nothing and were decimated. Did you still uh, feel optimistic or confident after the Tet Offensive began? Even more so, because it's one thing to be... Uh, uh, yes. Uh, yes, I was optim optimistic after the Tet Offensive, even more optimistic, uh, in a sense, than before, because it's one thing to have confidence that you're going to cope with this maximum effort. It's another thing to, to see that everyone was coping. And uh, you'll see that uh, the cables from Saigon, from Ambassador Bunker, uh, told us that the, the enemy was defeated. Uh, on the ground very early. It would take time to mop up. And uh, moreover, the reaction, the political reaction, and the energy of the government in coping was most heartening. Uh, one could feel that uh, that government that had been elected in the elections of 67 really became a government by coping with Tet. Uh, 
so that there was no doubt in anyone's mind watching the reaction after Tet, military and political in Vietnam, that we had achieved a great victory. The great question was, what would be the reaction of the United States? And if you go back to President Johnson's press conference shortly after Tet, this is exactly what he said. He didn't overdraw, he underplayed the, the degree of success he knew we had uh, militarily. He underplayed the degree of success he knew that we had in the sense of the South Vietnamese and reacted positively. But he, he uh, the question in his mind was the U.S political and, and uh, psychological reaction. And in retrospect, uh, this was a, a, a uh, the, the negative reaction was a result of two things. I think historians will share the blame with the U.S. media and the Johnson administration. <laughs> the public was surprised and shocked. Uh, for two reasons, basically. One, uh, Tet was grossly misinterpreted by the media. They either didn't understand it, and, and, and as Peter Braystrup's two volume shows, they depicted it to the American people in uh, uh, terms that just don't hold up with the facts or at the time or in retrospect. But I think equally, the Johnson administration and the president, as he acknowledges in his book, The Vantage Point, bear responsibility. And when I say the administration, I include myself. We did know what was coming. We did warn the Australians. Uh, I was, I briefed the press in my office about the coming offensive. There were briefings in Saigon, and uh, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, Buzz Wheeler, went out and gave a first-class speech in the Detroit Economic Club, saying we're going to face an Ardennes type of battle, kind of a uh, last gasp, maximum effort, and. Uh, but the only way that could have gotten through to the American people and prepared them for the shock, prepared them as well as the president was prepared, or his staff, would have been if the president had said this openly, just the way he'd said it to the Australian cabinet before Christmas 67. And in retrospect, he, he, he says in his book that he should have done it in the context of the State of the Union message. The reason is interesting. It's, it's a, for, these, for this, it's a very inadequate reason. The reason is that the convention is you don't let the enemy know how much you know. And uh, so it would have been regarded as rather bad form for the president to, <laughs> to do this. But in uh, any case, uh, that is where I would put the blame. There's no doubt that the, uh, there was a gross misinterpretation by the American people. Do you think, uh, can you explain why public support for the war was declining even before the Tet Offensive? Uh, the Tet Offensive came at a time when there had been a slow erosion of public support for the war. Uh, and I think that the uh, reason for it was one of the reasons that I wanted to act more decisively militarily, but it was best stated in an interview with Pham Van Dong with Bernard Fall in 1942, around the end of the year in the Saturday Evening Post. I have it in this office somewhere. I had it in the State Department uh, where I was in 62. I had it in the White House. But it, what it said essentially was, Americans do not like long, indecisive wars. This is going to be a long, indecisive war, and therefore we shall win. And uh, the, uh, I do think that uh, the, the tactics that President Johnson chose, which were supported by about 18 percent of the American people, uh, 55, 60 percent wanted a more vigorous military policy directly addressed to the North. And those who wanted to reduce our effort gradually rose from about 15 to 30 percent. Excuse me. Was that uh, Van Dong's interview in 1942? Types. It was the Hawks who said, no, this is going on too long. Begin sound roll 2620. Begin camera roll 638. Up will be 10, take 4. Walt Rostow, shooting day 43081. Ten, take four, and slate it. The public opinion, as I say, had been gradually e eroding in its support for the war, but it was only about up to about 30 percent of the public who felt that we should do less rather than more. The largest group was still, before Tet, about 55 percent felt we should do more. The first reaction to Tet was to increase the proportion of those describing themselves as hawks to over 60 percent. But when the president did not take decisive action, 
militarily to conform to this uh, mood. And then when he decided he wasn't going to run, I think uh, the combination of the lack of preparation of the people for Tet, which would, could have been avoidable, the bad uh, projection of what happened at Tet to the American people by the media, uh, the lack of a vigorous military response, and then the president saying he wasn't going to run, led a great many uh, people who had supported, not the president so much, he had only about 18% support for his tactic, but the 50 plus 50% 50 who were really hawks, say, well, if we're not going to go in and win this thing decisively, let's get out or begin to get out. And that, I think, was the, the progressive sort of uh, defection that eroded the position down through 68. While in the field, <laughs> uh, Westmoreland and Abrams were rolling up the enemy and uh, the economy was reviving and all sorts of things. And pol the political system was gaining strength. So that Mr. Nixon came in with a very good position in the field, politically, very good position in the field militarily, but a, a country that had just about had enough of it uh, politically, what, at home. What, in your estimation, was the communist objective at Quezon? At Quezon, I think they had uh, uh, a, as always, with them, multiple objectives. I think that uh, what they, their basic objective was to pin down a lot of U.S. ground forces, ground forces, so that they could get the forces of their own in on the coast behind them to get into the cities. Uh, and uh, the second objective was if they could pull off a Dien Bien Phu and force the surrender of the garrison, uh, that would be a, a maximum result. What happened, in fact, is that with very few men on the ground, quite a lot of air power, artillery, we pinned down two to four of their divisions and they never were able to get into the, the coastal area. But uh, I think those were the two objectives of, of uh, Quezon. What was your reaction to the request by the military for an additional 206,000 troops at the time of Tet? Did that seem justified to you? It seemed justified. I thought that the extra troops would be justified uh, only if we use them in a very active policy to force an end of the war on the ground. Uh, through putting uh, forces into North Vietnam as far as north as Vin and blocking off on the ground with U.S. forces the multiple uh, uh, trails in Laos. I didn't think uh, we would need or justify that uh, additional force for more of the same. And uh, the, uh, that, that was my, my, my basic uh, judgment on it. Now, in fact, uh, we did not... Uh, what, when I heard that this request came in, my recommendation was that we set up a task force that would look at all the variables bearing on this question, including our balance of payments, uh, what the South Vietnamese themselves could do by way of an increased effort, and uh, that we have a very sober assessment of this. But well before that assessment was over and well before it got into the New York Times, the president decided he would not do it. Uh, add to the troops, I think he put in an extra 20,000 or so. But he, that was, I think, for two reasons. One, then the most fundamental, which saved him the problem, was that the uh, South Vietnamese increased their own mobilization remarkably, and the M16 rifle, which was in short supply, uh, I only learned that at the time, and don't understand why to this day, uh, the M16 rifle, obviously, in the president's view, should go first to the Vietnamese rather than to American forces. Secondly, we had a balance of payments crisis at that time. And, uh, but uh, the underlying reason, things were going very well in Vietnam. Do you remember the president's reaction <clears throat> when you suggested that uh, you came out in favor of the additional troops? Did you speak to him about that? No, my first initial reaction was, was, was for the troops, but my view was... Uh, that what I felt was that my personal reaction didn't matter, and I, I myself wouldn't feel comfortable until I looked into it. Uh, so I was not giving him a, a, a sober thing, a sober judgment. What I recommended to him was that we set up a, a, an inquest, and I drafted out the terms of reference for that inquest, and he forwarded them. And now, <clears throat> what was your reaction to the conclusions of the task force, which, which seemed to go against the idea of uh, more troops? 
No, by that time it was perfectly obvious that A, we, uh, well, there was no will in, the president was not prepared to, to advocate uh, the use of the additional troops for the purposes that I thought they should be used for, for operations outside South Vietnam. We had balance of payments problems, we had M16 problems, and, uh, you know, one of the recommendations of that task force that neither he nor I agreed with, nor Dean Rust, was there should be no new peace initiative. I don't know whether you're aware that that was one of the recommendations of the task force. The president was clear that we were going to have a peace initiative as soon as we, we finished the, uh, showing these fellows that they'd failed at Tet. And I'd always had it envisaged for May, in my mind, because that is the, in terms of the weather, the end of the dry weather in, in uh, Vietnam. And, uh, but he, uh, he, he told the Australians that he was going to follow a, a success in setting them back. We were, but the task force under Clifford came up with a proposal of no new peace initiative. What, how did the peace initiative get... But, but the peace initiative emerged very naturally as things unfolded successfully through February. Early in March, uh, Secretary Rusk uh, uh, sent over a proposal which, uh, by a group of British intellectuals, including Barbara Ward, that we should adopt a, adopt a communist strategy of negotiate and fight. And that we should start by uh, seeing if we could trigger this by offering a, a, actually carrying out a bombing halt. And this rather appealed to Secretary Rusk because he said, let's just, we've obviously set them back, let's just stop bombing and see what happens. And when the, Mr. Rusk suggested this very early in March, he said, now Dean, you get right on to that. And uh, he and I worked on it. I knew he was working on the refinement of this proposal. And the president knew about it. And uh, we were talking about a speech. And in my own mind, I was very confident there would be a proposal in it uh, because the, th the because situation was unfolding very well on the ground, both politically and militarily. Uh, the, I remember we had a session and uh, we brought Arthur Goldberg down from New York. And uh, we laid out the uh, proposal. I mean, Mr. Rusk laid out the proposal. We had uh, quite a lot of uh, resistance to it. But in any case, uh, it, it was clear to me that the president felt that the time had come to make a proposal, and, and Rusk's proposal of stopping the bombing and offering to negotiate from a position of strength. But we offered it. Uh, we stopped the bombing, except in the tactical area, so a, little, a bit north of the... Uh, the parallel, so that we would not be leaving our troops open to harassment. What was the position of <coughs> Clark Clifford? He was now Secretary of Defense uh, in all this, and, and what was your own? <coughs> on what issues did you agree or disagree with him? Well, it's it, it's very hard because his position changed in the course of March. <coughs> uh, the, the, my uh, uh, Clark Clifford was a friend uh, in this period, very close friend. He came into this job at a difficult moment, and uh, from my post. Uh, which incidentally, for anyone holding it, has a potential asset of being a man who works in a healing way with his colleagues. And Clark Clifford was a close friend. I worked with him and we agreed on most things and may have disagreed on some. But the only thing I will say is that his position on the bombing business and the negotiating situation changed in the course of the month. Sometime around mid-month, uh, he was against uh, the Rusk type of proposal in which you'd stop without any prior guarantees from Hanoi uh, and see what happened. Uh, he wanted to get some sort of guarantee but through quiet diplomacy because we had never lost contact with Hanoi throughout this period diplomatically. Uh, he, he, oppo he, he opposed Rusk's proposal. By the end of the month he agreed with it. Did you uh, go into the role of the wise men that, that when they, they had their meeting in March and <coughs> did you call these they concluded that the, they came to the conclusion that the war had to be de-escalated. Uh, <clears throat> how did you feel about that? And do you feel they were properly briefed on the situation? Uh, the wise men's meeting is uh, hard to evaluate in history because it took place after the president had made all his fundamental decisions. He was not, he decided he wasn't going to run, he decided he was going to make the speech, he decided he was going to follow the Rusk proposal of stopping the bombing in, uh, of the North, uh, except in the tactical area, and offering to negotiate. All of that had been settled before they met. 
uh, my own interpretation of uh, the, uh, the so-called wise man's meeting was that it dramatized a split in the establishment uh, of uh, which had come about uh, in the after Tet perhaps had been growing for some time. And uh, it simply saddened me. My reaction was incorporated uh, in a note I wrote to Dick Helms, who was sitting next to me while they were there. Ten, take five. As for the wise men, I, uh, the, uh, at the time they met towards the end of March, I think all of the principal decisions had been made by the president. He had, uh, what he had foreshadowed with the Australians had come true. There had been this maximum effort. It had been set back. Uh, he was ready to make his uh, uh, peace proposal. Uh, Rusk had taken the lead. And uh, uh, the meeting of the wise men, I think, as he, the president says in his memoirs, was uh, a kind of demonstration of the uh, the split in the establishment that was evident in, in many other ways. I think he brought them together primarily to get them briefed by Abrams and others as to what the exact situation was. He himself believed that it was a situation which, if you had the facts, uh, should be heartening. Let's go on to the, <clears throat> to the speech that he finally delivered on March 31st. Could you describe your role in drafting the speech and... and <clears throat> Uh, your agreement or, or attitudes towards the proposals for the peace talks and the partial bombing? I had no uh, significant role in the drafting of the speech itself. Uh, but I had taken it for granted since early March, when to my certain knowledge the President had told Secretary Rust to go to work hard on this proposal that he had in mind. And I had been in touch with him upon it. He held this very tight. And the president was adamant that we not put it into early drafts of the speech, just as he was adamant that no one write in the fact that he wasn't going to run again. But I was, uh, I just assumed from early March, and indeed I assumed from the, hearing the president talk to the Australians that we were going to have a uh, peace proposal sometime in the wake of the Tet Offensive. When did you first learn that the president was been, <coughs> was, had decided not to run for re-election, and what was your own reaction to that? Well, I only learned definitively when he called us up on the March 31st and told my wife and I to get over to the White House. He wanted to show us something before a speech. But I had heard him, the first time I would ever heard him say he was not going to run, uh, flatly, was in the early autumn of 67. Uh, the second time, there were two occasions actually within a month uh, in the autumn in which he, to a group, said, now, I wish you all to know that if, as of this moment, I shall not run in, in November 68. I haven't fully made up my mind, but you sh that's the presupposition on which you should operate. And when Westmoreland was home in November, he called Westmoreland aside and asked him whether the troops in the field would understand if the commander-in-chief said he was not going to run. And Westmoreland thought about it and said, yes, they would understand. And I do believe that General Westmoreland was the last man who could have uh, persuaded the president to to run in 68. As you observe, <clears throat> Lyndon Johnson, what do you think motivated his decision not to run again? I think first he was fearful of his health, not afraid of dying, but afraid of a stroke. There was stroke in his family, and he once told me he never walked past the picture of Woodrow Wilson without shuddering and thinking what in a nuclear age would happen if you had a disabled a president disabled with stroke but uh, not dead and, uh, and the ambiguities that would go with that. Secondly, as he told Robert Kennedy on the 4th of April in a remarkable interview with him, it was the last time they met and it was a healing occasion, he said that uh, he had consciously used up his, his capital in his domestic ventures and uh, he thought that another man might better unify the country. He said the next president would not be able to get a great deal out of Congress in terms of social legislation. But nevertheless, he thought that, uh, that uh, he had used up his capital uh, as he intended to, and that it was time for another man who might better unify the country. But those, I think, were the two decisive things.
when the <coughs> peace talks, the so-called peace talks, started in Paris in May of '68, how would you de would you describe the mood? Was it euphoric? <coughs> did was it optimistic? Did <coughs> people in the administration? Did you yourself <coughs> think that now the war was going to wind down? Uh, I I was not euphoric. I assure you. Oh, so far as the peace talks opening in Paris, uh, I think we were pleased that we had come to that stage, and we had earned it. By we, incidentally, I mean the South Vietnamese, the Koreans, the Thais, everyone ourselves had seen through the Tet Offensive. We had earned it the hard way. Uh, on the other hand, there was not one member of the administration involved in these matters that didn't remember the Korean negotiations, which started in 51 and only ended in 53 so that uh, we didn't think that uh, we were not about to throw our hats in the air and think that we were home free and the killing would wholly stop. Uh, I, I'd say that uh, the fundamental attitudes we had were we were uh, pleased at the performance of the South Vietnamese and our own forces at Tet. We were very pleased with the political reaction in South Vietnam and the coming to a greater maturity and cohesion of the government. We were glad the negotiations were started but there was no naivete about uh, when or if they would yield a constructive result. How did you feel about <clears throat> the decision later in that year to go on to a full bombing hold? The decision to go on to a full bombing hold in October was an extremely difficult decision to make. Uh, I did recommend that we, we, we go with it, and I wrote a special memorandum for the president. And uh, uh, the decisive voice in that, incidentally, was General Abrams, who had a most moving session around the cabinet table, which went on into the early hours of the morning, was finally asked by the president. And uh, he said, uh, uh, President asked him, General, if you were in my position, uh, would you make this decision? And Abrams thought, and he said, Mr. President, it will plunge you into a cesspool of controversy but I would make the decision. Now the reason all of us knew in the back of our minds that from the communist point of view there was a political element in this and we hated to have a, that element in it. On the other hand, as commander-in-chief responsible for the lives of his own men and indirectly for the lives of South Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, other, the president felt and I, th I felt uh, in support of him that if there was any chance that this could bring uh, a peace a day earlier, and, uh, that he had no right to reject it. But because of its timing, uh, it was a most painful decision for the president to make. Now, <clears throat> one thing I think is, I'd like to clarify <clears throat> is in your own position, because at one stage you're in favor of landing, uh, of actually intervening on the ground in North Vietnam, which it seemed to be a very hawkish position, and here you are supporting a full bombing halt, which seems to be a very dovish position. Could you square this circle for us? Well, I, uh, I've been described as a hawk and a dove. I've been attacked from the experts from the left and the right. Uh, if you're in a war, as we were, and war means people are getting killed, your overriding objective it has nothing to do with hawks and doves. Your overriding objective is to get the war over as soon as possible with the minimum loss of life. I myself felt that without enlarging the war, a more decisive use of American power could have ended that war sooner. I was not about to make my judgment an occasion for withdrawing my support from President Johnson, who took a different view of the appropriate conduct of the war. The reason I did not uh, sort of resign on principle was that he was the man that had been elected uh, by the American people in a nuclear age to make this kind of decision. And uh, I greatly admired and respected uh, what he was trying to do within our society and admired and respected the way he took a minority position on the conduct of the war, even if I thought it, he was not right. And a uh, great sense of love and compassion for a president making these tough decisions, and if I could help him even a little, I was about to do it. But I did not agree with the way with his the military uh, methods that he used in the war. I thought they were too protracted and painful and costly. Now, <coughs> it's also been reported, could you speak to this subject, that you, you were there 
in a way, sort of keeping up the president's morale during very difficult periods. Could you, if this is in fact true, I mean, could you give us some examples of what you were doing? With uh, my role in relationship to the president was to uh, to serve him in, in providing in, in information and trying to co help coordinate things in the town and when asked to give him what advice I had. Uh, I did not take it uh, to be my task uh, to be a morale builder in the sense of uh, giving him, uh, providing him with excessively cheerful information. Uh, it's possible that uh, my presence on his staff uh, was a minor comfort to him simply because uh, uh, I'm not only a viscerally cheerful fellow, but my views about Asia had been formed out of research and quiet study in the 50s. I never, I had deeply rooted views about the importance of Southeast Asia in our own interest and the stability of Asia. And uh, I would have much preferred to have worked in a Washington in the 60s in which I could have spent all my time on economic development problems and not on a war, but I think the fact that uh, my views were deeply grounded and I went about my business a uh, certain amount of good cheer uh, may have been something of a support to him, but I was not a, a cheerleader. But in, <coughs> apart from... May I call a cut? I'm sorry. Uh, I think in the... And go ahead. In March of 68, I do believe Secretary Rusk was uh, peculiarly important to the president. He understood uh, better than I did that the president's decision not to run was coming up. And he probably, he certainly had a better insight into the notion that this peace initiative he was working on might in some way relate to that. I wasn't bright enough to make that connection. Uh, but uh, so that uh, uh, the from early March, when the president instructed him, and I was present when it was done, to follow the lead that he had laid before the president, uh, I had no doubt that a peace initiative was coming, and I think Mr. Rusk had the notion that it might very well relate to the president's announcement that he wasn't going to run in 1968. Now, the last point I want to raise, and I'll give you a little elbow room here. Looking back, what do you think went wrong in Vietnam? That's the first point. And secondly, what do you what do you think the effect of Vietnam has been? Two separate questions. Yeah, all right, let's do the first one. What went wrong in Vietnam uh, is Watergate. Uh, without Watergate, I believe that the agreement made by President Nixon and Secretary of State Kissinger in early '73 would have held up. Uh, the president had been re-elected with an overwhelming majority. He had great prestige. He had promised in writing, laid down four two very important conditions of American support should the Hanoi violate uh, the agreement. But in the course of 73, uh, President Nixon lost his legitimacy as Watergate came to overwhelm him. If you read his biography, it's an extraordinary document because uh, you just watch this cancerous growth. And uh, of course Congress then came out from under in this business of cutting aid and, and really destroying the South Vietnamese began, which was consummated by the Watergate Congress. And I honestly believe that the war would have been won as in Korea uh, without Watergate. Now the other aspect of the war is that I do believe it was fought down through uh, uh, 67, 68, 69, down to 75. It took so long uh, because of the strategy that was followed. I think it, in 67, when we had really established a, a logistical base and had gotten improvement of our position, if we'd acted decisively, I think we could have ended the war in 68. Uh, but the, uh, those are the two elements. There's a third element of what went wrong, which is not much discussed, which goes back to the Kennedy period. If President Kennedy had insisted, even at the risk of some military action, that the Laos Accords be honored, negotiated with great pain in 62, 
in which the Soviets were to guarantee that Hanoi not transit Laos against South Vietnam, and we were going to make Laos a, a Finland, to use the Soviet analogy. If we had been very tough in inf as tough in enforcing the agreement as we were in negotiating it, I think the tragedy of Southeast Asia would have ended then. Just let me ask a quick question with respect to this. Do you think, <clears throat> what do you think about the possibility that if combat troops had been put in as early as 61, late 61, as was recommended in the mission you went out to Taylor? Comment on that. I don't, uh, the question of the uh, combat troops that General Taylor and I recommended be put in in 61, uh, I don't really believe that was a very important matter in the history of the war. I think that uh, we wanted to put them in to stabilize the area, and we had a fear as we went up in two corps, I remember, and General Don briefed us, and there was some danger that we felt that the country might be cut in half by some sudden move from the highlands, and also that there would be a stabilization of morale. Also, we put engineers in, they could help with the floods and do other useful things around the countryside. But uh, I think the fact that President Kennedy did not put those troops in, what he did do was to keep a, uh, I think, a Marine battalion at sea to hand for some emergency, uh, was not a fundamental determinant uh, of the outcome one way or another. Because you remember 1962 was a good year for our side. It began to come unstuck in 63 when Jim began to press forward his brother knew. I'd like to ask something. If you could just say very briefly, um, back in 67, I shared Westmoreland's optimism because. Right. Just that much? Yeah. And then maybe you sentence to it. Back in uh, 67, I shared Westmoreland's temperate optimism uh, because basically we were staring at the same body of evidence military evidence, political evidence, economic evidence. One last question. <clears throat> What do you think, looking at it today, has been the impact of Vietnam on our country and our position in the world? The impact of, of Vietnam, the engagement in Vietnam on the United States uh, is extremely difficult to sort out. It's a multiple uh, set of impacts, and they were different at different times. Uh, there was the, uh, the anti-war movement, for example, which cannot be wholly separated from other things that have very little to do with Vietnam, which were taking place in the United States and other advanced industrial countries. The revolt of the, the, the university students who found themselves no longer in an elite position, but a kind of mass position, uh, the, uh, which is a general reaction, Japan, Western Europe, United States. Uh, the reaction against uh, materialistic affluence and so on, those things all interwove. That was the 60s, that was the march on the Pentagon, and that sort of thing. Uh, then there was the reaction of uh, the split in the establishment. The establishment really formed up, uh, had deeper roots when? When Stimson and Knox came in 1940 to work with Franklin Roosevelt, uh, pulling together a, a group who were uh, going to back a Democratic president, carrying on an interventionist, internationalist policy. And you can almost date it from that day to the meeting of the wise men when it split. Uh, but that was a very traumatic event, and we haven't healed that up yet. Uh, then there's the quite different question of the reaction of the American people to the fact of our withdrawing defeat and seeing on television our scrambling out of Saigon and leaving in a lie in the lurch, a, a, a traumatic event which, of which we haven't yet taken the full measure. So that uh, I, I do not pretend to have uh, tried to form a fully mature and balanced view of the impact of Vietnam. All I will say, it's, it's multiple, has many dimensions, and different dimensions at different times. And there's been no great historian of this passage in our history. You couldn't venture a <coughs> comment on the impact of Vietnam as it, the scar of Vietnam today on our country. At the present time, the, you cannot talk about the impact of Vietnam on the United States because its uh, impact is so different. I'm a teacher, so I live with young people. 
for them, they blessedly are born into the world all afresh, and uh, Vietnam in the 60s is as far away as the Second World War or the first of the Civil War for many of the younger people. And they want to know why, why it happened. They're not going to be burdened. For those who lived through the 60s, to whom it was a traumatic event, uh, uh, and who felt passionately about it one way or t'other, uh, it's something they'll carry through their lives. This is not unique. Uh, uh, earlier generations in Europe car carried the Spanish Civil War and the, the controversies over that through their lives, or the Suez Crisis. And, uh, so, uh, but it's, it was a major traumatic event and, and uh, for a lot of human beings. But right now, I think that we are a resilient country, basically. Uh, it was a troubling, demeaning event, the full meaning of which people haven't uh, evolved. I think that uh, starting with, let's say, the Soviet move into Afghanistan, there's been the reforming of a, a new consensus that, in a sense, we've got to put that behind us and, and get on with the job of looking after our, in, after our interests again. And uh, there's been quite a lot of healing I wouldn't overestimate it, though, for individual human beings, but the country has come through it in intolerable shape, but at enormous cost in the 70s. <coughs> Use up the real by having you tell us again what you recommend in terms of going north in 1968 to finish the war. Just, just yes. We've got less than a minute, okay, so. Yes. And say Ho Chi Minh Trail rather than Trails and Love. In 1967, and then again in the wake of Tet, what I would have preferred that we do uh, would have been to move our own forces into uh, North Vietnam, as far north as Vinh, and then uh, uh, block the Ho Chi Minh trails in Laos with our forces on the ground. I think that would have ended the war. Did you tell the president, did you recommend this? Yes, I recommended it in 67, and I recommended uh, very much this in 68. Everybody quiet, room tone, camera running, and noise. Pull it out. Can you move back? I, I Make some edits. Can I check with you? Of course you can. Yeah. Okay, and I'll put it.